if you know any way to shorten these services, well, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be glad to hear what you have to say. Of course, you that have been with me long enough to know that Jesus just works so wonderfully and the hour is late and the, I'm not speaking of the late hour, but the late hour in the 20th century and uh, the need is great. And so we come together and God works in a very special way. I want to speak to you for a few moments tonight on the last part of the scripture I shared with you this morning, not as a text, but as a continuation of the text that I spoke to you on Wednesday about Wednesday night. Wednesday night had to do with the good seed are the children of heaven. The good seed are the children of heaven. And today I went further and re I rephrased that text entitled today's sermon, Ye are the good seed. And I took you into part of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, Ye are the salt of the earth. And then in the 14th verse, where Jesus said, Ye are the light of the world. I read on. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Now, I never noticed that till I was reading it to you now. It giveth light unto all that are in the house. The match that I lit the other night in total darkness lit everything and anyone. I happened to be the only person in the kitchen when it was lit, but the light fell on me. Ye are the light of the world. Any house you go into, you light up that house. There's a song, a popular song that also has a spiritual touch, an anointed touch to it, that says, You light up my life. These are God's people. They're the only true lights. And then the 16th verse, which I want, where I want to uh, concentrate my remarks. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I want to make one correction uh, for those of you who know anything about the Greek. When I spoke of the Greek words kai hutos, I wish to make a correction. Only hutos is mentioned here in the Greek. Not is, The conjunction's not there. That's in the 11th chapter of Romans where it says, And so Israel, and so kai hutos, and so Israel, so all Israel shall be saved. Here, the Greek word uh, hutos, which is translated so, is an adverb of manner. It means that in this manner, let your light shine. And so the New American Standard Bible translated, I think, the best from the Greek, or at least it's one of the better translations. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let. Let means that something is within your power. You have something to do with whether or not your light shines. The Master has said, Ye are the light of the world. Now he says, Let that light shine. If you're really a light, uh, a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. And if you travel with us through the Holy Land, you know that one of the, one of the wonderful sights that we see in the plains is, is the cities that are on the hills. And they can't be hid. The lights are there. And, uh, of course, this says here, a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. It's not referring to nighttime. It's referring to seeing the city by day. Nevertheless, you... To, with today's cities, you see them both in the day and in the night. Of course, if there are any torches burning back in the old days or fires at night, you could see them then too because the light would just shine, shine, shine. And Jesus says, let, permit 
your light to shine. Isn't that something? Has something to do now with our own willingness or not being willing um, to let this light shine. That means that it is in our own control. Now what I want to dwell upon here tonight has to do with two different things. It's how that your light may shine. It says, let it shine, in these better Greek translations, let your light shine before men in such a way. The King James says, uh, let your light so shine. But that's an adverb of banner. In such a way. Let your light shine, all right? How are we to let our light shine? The first thing I want to point out is that witness is necessary. You cannot... Now hear me carefully. I've already said that the Word becomes flesh in order that it became, become, become the Word again because the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The Word of God becomes flesh and becomes the Word again as it issues forth from your life. I've also said there is such a thing as a silent witness. But dear ones, remember, we are to acknowledge Him in all our ways. It, may, it doesn't mean, I mean, wisdom necessitates that we be very careful in winning souls to Christ. And I pointed out that God, our Lord's methods were different. We don't go up to a, a sinner and say, don't you know you're a sinner and you're dying and going to hell? That'd be a very exceptional thing for us to do that. Our Lord didn't win people to Christ that way. He said, what seek ye? He said to another, follow me. He said to Simon, your name is now Rock. He said to Nathaniel, Nathaniel, I know what your heart's like. I saw you under the fig tree. You're a man that has no guile. And he was, he was one at that point. He became a disciple of Christ. The only people that he spoke to and told them that they were sinners were the Pharisees. And the only man he ever said you must be born again to was a man who really professed religion. His name was Nicodemus. Spoke to one man. You must be born again, Nicodemus. You're a religious man, but you don't know anything about the things of the Spirit, and you, don't, and you do not receive our witness. That's what he said. It means that Nicodemus was not a follower of Christ and was not yet a converted man. If you read the third chapter closely, Nicodemus was not a converted man. Isn't this something as I review this? How wonderful this is. So God wants us to let our light shine, and he wants it done in wisdom, you see. He wants us to be as wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves. And so he said, there's a way to let your light shine. Now, you've got to be willing to do it. You've got to permit it. But there is a way to do it. All right? If we never give glory to God, we'll, give all the, we'll get all the credit. And that's contrary to the text. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. As men see your good works, then there has to be a witness. They say, oh, you're such a wonderful person. You have to say, well, I want to tell you, it's only because of Jesus. And there's a witness. Oh, it's so wonderful. So and so is so wonderful. Well, we want to thank God because only God can do that. For all of us are sinners saved by grace. See, there is a witness to be made. So part of letting our light shine, the how, in this manner, has to do with giving God the praise and the glory. We are called out of darkness to show forth the praises. This royal priesthood is to show forth the praises of God who has called us, who has saved us from this awful darkness and brought us into this marvelous light. So, dear ones, we must, we must speak. Now, that leads us to the second point. Huh. Witnessing takes death. And in order to let your light shine, we have to deny ourselves. Now, before I get further into that, I want to get to the main part of the sermon and take you to a verse. You remember I've been speaking. This has all come out 
of that the good seed are the children of the kingdom. Seed? What, what, did I not remember that, this, that these seed were wheat seed? Am I not correct? In the parable of the tares, as it's called, as the disciples call it. Well, I, okay, wheat. Turn with me to John 12. We're speaking of the how. Beginning with the 21st, and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now here we're, here we're going to get into the how. How to let your light shine. Because we're dealing with the seed of the kingdom. All right, and we're doing wheat seed, right? Okay. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. There's a death necessary before the light of God can shine. All of you are very beautiful. But not everybody can see that beauty because it's clouded and covered with self-assertiveness. It's covered with suspicion sometimes. Now, a person of God is not suspicious, but if we're not careful, we'll gather some things about us. Daddy used to preach a sermon called Barnacles. And they tell, tell about the ship going into port. I was very young when I first heard this sermon. The ship goes into port, and it has to go into port because as it sails through the seas, these parasites gather on the hull until it slows the ship down and causes the motors to labor or the sails not to be able to move the ship as it would like. And so they bring it into port, and they scrape the barnacles off. So often, as we travel through this life, the barnacles, the parasites, attach themselves to us. We, we fail to read the word, pray, witness, and obey, or be at church regularly. And something's happened to our life. You see? So we need God's help very much. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. I was about to say that all of you are very beautiful. And I stand in amazement when I look at your lives and I look at the beauty of your countenance. I look at the beauty, which, which is a reflection of the heart. Now, if your heart's very ugly, it's hard to see. But I know. And I believe, here's where I'll bring in a scripture here. Oh, precious Jesus. I, I just want to think about somebody being offended with me. I just, you know, it just, oh, it makes me tremble. I just trust this morning folks weren't offended with me. Did you know what Doris said to me? Is Doris with us tonight? Yes. You know what she said to me so sweetly when I went back? She said, Brother Hoke, I was one of those chewing gum. Doris is a lady. And a beautiful lady at that. But she's one of the most humble pilgrims I know on the face of this earth. Now, others were offended with me this morning. Because I demonstrated to get a point across. You remember I went. And I said it's unethical to do that. And some people didn't like that. I could tell it. Now Doris is so much like a child. And such a beautiful person in Christ. That she won't tell me. Now pastor I'm sorry. I was chewing gum. I didn't see her chewing gum. The only reason I can talk this way now. Is because her, her heart is golden. Jesus told us a long time ago she was very special and that the, her husband and her coming to us was of the kingdom of God and that it had there, there was oh, things over the hill that we cannot see yet because whatever God's in has no end. It'll blossom after a while. I've wondered about those precious brothers of his. I've wondered, Doris, where this goes. I don't know where it goes, but I know it's good enough just to be together in this place. I'm thankful that Doris wasn't offended with me. And yet, there were persons this morning who were offended with me. They didn't have enough. Now, now, what made them ugly in their response? 
Maybe my manner was not as good as it should be. But that's the way my teacher used to do at school. She'd, she'd get some gum. She said, how's this look? Well, it didn't look good. I didn't think she ought to do that. But I didn't know how it looked for me to do that. And folks, if you want to, most people, if you've got somebody close to them, and like you're in a car together, something like that, and you, you smack it very long, and you might get smacked. He could just drive the nerves clear out. You know, crack, pop, you know. And it's not breakfast food. It's unnecessary chewing. See my point? See, it was a simple point. A simple point of ethics. The people of God are to be more ethical than the ethical people of the world. Not less ethical. God's people are to shine. Let your light so shine. And if the preacher gives you a little point in ethics, be glad about it. Be as nice to me as Doris was. I've contended that the people of God ought to be the best looking. Ought to outshine everything coming and going. Why, do we, why should we stoop and make exceptions for ourselves that we have reason to be less than ethical? You know what, man? You know what? Now, this is about your light shine. Here, we're talking about manners. I'm so surprised I don't hardly know what to do. In what manner do you let your light shine? By being ethical? By being nice. What are manners? Now, I'm not talking about the kind of manners that make you tremble. I'm, I've been with people and I'm, com- I'm, I'm uncomfortable all the time because they seem like they spend, they spend day and night reading the ethics book. I don't know whether to, to eat chicken with one finger or to try to stab it with a fork. I know what the rule says, but I don't know if they know what it says. The rule says I can pick up one end of that chicken in certain places, and in certain other places I can pick up two ends. I have to know where I'm at and what I'm doing. I don't want to be offensive in the president's place. And if the president's place, I'm supposed to pick up the end of the chicken and scrape the chicken off and then, you know, then use my fork, and that's what I'm supposed to do. But in other places, you know, out at the picnic table or even in my home, I can pick up both ends of the, of the, of the drumstick and eat, and it still be good manners. Although I believe that my mother was right when she said, try to use the very best manners at home so it'll become first nature to you. That's why I never come to the table, try not to come without a shirt. Because it's, it's bad manners. It's ugly. It's offensive for a man to come to the, to the table. See, now, I don't know how you live, but it's offensive. And, and women folk have a sensitivity that we men folk don't have. We have to learn it from them. And that's why, they're, that's why God gives them to us. They, they have a sensitivity that's just so good. Amen. God puts a man with a woman. Uh, the men are to listen because they have a sensitivity that's just so rare and fine that it helps us act better. We're not supposed to be offended. I said to my wife, uh, she has such good speech and her diction and her, her speaking is so good, you be sure and write down the words I misuse so that I can get them all straight. It took me years to learn how to say wash. Because when I, back in my country, you didn't say wash, you said wash. I didn't know that, I didn't know that wash was wash. I didn't know that. Because in the Boot Hill, Missouri, you said wash, not wash. Be sure, ethics work both ways. Be sure not to make fun of anybody saying wash. Or the certain things that come out of the mountains here because all over the land there's different, there's different sounds. Some of them very, you know, you could appreciate a southerner for his draw. Appreciate a person from Michigan for their preciseness. First time I ever heard about it, somebody from Michigan, I didn't know whether they had dental problems or what it was. <laughs> because they, they found out that I was from the state of Missouri and that I had lived in Arkansas. And I just looked. I thought, this is unbelievable. What are they trying to pull on me? They weren't trying to pull anything. They just spoke very precise. 
And I was from Arkansas, and I spoke with a drawl, you see. So I have a mixture of a Midwest um, style of speaking and with a Southern flavor. I, I've never forget my first experience at the barbershop up here in the state of West Virginia. A man first started to cut my hair, and he, I talked to him a little bit, and he said, uh, in, a, in a manner of speaking, he said, I perceive you're from Arkansas. Well, I heard him speak. I said, sir, I perceive you're from West Virginia. He heard something strange in my speech. I said, yes, sir, I lived in Arkansas. I said, although I didn't get my draw from the state of Arkansas, I got it in other places in the Boot Hill, Missouri. What I'm saying is that I'm not talking about being a stuffed shirt. Nobody, it's uncomfortable around people like that. Let me tell you something. Reverend Mrs. Helm have the finest manners of anybody I've ever been with. But did you know why? You're comfortable with them. I've never been uncomfortable in, in the world with them. And they can eat at the king's tables because they know what they... Manners also has to do with making someone comfortable who may not have been as well trained as you've been or been exposed to the discipline that you've been... It's making the person comfortable who's in your presence and not making them feel uncomfortable. See, God wants us to be that way. Manners, folks, is simply loving each other like Jesus loves us. Manners is making the other person comfortable. And it's, it's handling yourself in a way so you don't make the other person uncomfortable. Sometimes we're to dress a certain way with a certain group. In Rome, we do as the Romans do. So we don't want to be so self-assertive. They'll say, well, now my dress, the way I dress is just any old way will do. No, it won't. You see, you make a personal statement by the way you dress. Sometimes what that person's really like is not coming out because there's a defense mechanism up there. We have to be careful. See, I'm speaking to each of you not to bring any judgment on someone else. I have to work hard at that so that you won't do that because I'm to look at all men as if they had perfect manners. And if God's taught me a little... And I have a long way to go to be a perfect, to be a gentleman. But you know, it's much more comfortable to be that way. I'm delighted when I find out how I'm supposed to do and what makes the other person comfortable and, and be able to travel in any area of society, any layer of society. There's stuffed shirts at every level. And some of the most ignorant people on earth are some of the stuffiest. Because they think that their, that their country grubbing way of doing and talking is the only honest way to be. And they're aggravated by anybody who has a little blue blood in them. Or the blue blood thinks that everybody else is scoundrels. Everybody, and, and see, if I, but I tell you this, I find just as much prejudice at every level. Because prejudice has to do with an awful attitude within us. Self-assertiveness. When you're like that, your light can't shine. God wants our light to shine. Let your light so shine in this manner. With manners. That wasn't in my sermon notes, but sure is good, isn't it? He said, except a corn of wheat die. You see, we have to die. We have to die to our self-assertiveness. Maybe there's something in our background that's not quite acceptable to, to the best of society. Then let's be willing to give it up. There are things in all of our lives that we could be better without. A word or a phrase or a manner of acting that would be better off because it's, it's terribly offensive. And remember, we're witnesses for Christ. Of course we can't help the stuffed shirt. He needs a lot of help. And Jesus would square off with the stuffed shirts. You know, the fellows, they had, boy, I tell you, they had to wash all the pots and the pans, and they didn't do it. They didn't know anything about germs. They just do it as a matter of ceremony. And they, when the disciples plucked the grain, oh, they were offended. And Jesus said, you're so clean outwardly, but your hearts are so dirty. You whitewashed sepulchers. 
you hypocrites, you vipers. Boy, he had something to say about them. He met them head on. But think, think of Je Jesus had the perfect manners in all things. He was always thoughtful not to offend. Isn't that wonderful? I just, it, I'm richly blessed. Of course, Jesus is the light. And his light shone throughout the Palestine of that day. But he's trying to shine through us. See, while I'm preaching, I'm, I'm thinking of myself. When I think of me trying to be an example and preaching to you, then I, it brings me almost... See, I've had a time staying up here all night. It's been the greatest of labor for me today to try to be faithful. See, because I, what I'd like to do, but I have to deny myself if God's called me to preach tonight, then I've got to stay here and share this with you. See, I'm having to die to do it. Because uh, when I get on things like this, I say, Oh, God, please help me. Because I know I'm more on the spot. The world is looking at us, and so we must act in a certain way. We don't want to drive up to a place and be offended with somebody at a, at a four-way stop, and because they do wrong or sail out through a stop sign, lay down on our horn like some carnal idiot. That's not nice. You know what? I've done... Whenever I see people do things unless it's absolutely necessary, I don't say anything with my horn. Boy, when we were in Egypt some time ago in Cairo, Egypt, we heard till two in the morning, honk, honk. We heard, we heard a million horns blow. Oh, there was such anger. There was such meanness. Honk, 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 boop, beep, 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 boop, boop. Just boom, boom, on and on and on. And Brother Hill said, can you hear the anger in the horns? I said, sir, I can hear it. But you see, they, they're taught another religion. They're not taught to love people as Jesus loves people. They have a morality and a high morality to tell in, in the, the, this certain faith. But, you see, what Jesus has taught us is different. It tells you to be careful with your horn honking. When you speak to people at the place of business, you want to be careful because right there you're letting your light shine. But you know, folks, when something's wrong, you've got to die unless the corn of wheat dies. See, in Christianity, we have no rights. We have no rights. We never assert our rights. When we get saved, we give them all to Jesus. He's the one that fights our battles. So again and again and again, the Lord takes, uh, uh, tells us to take the losses and to pay for the losses, both personally and corporately. Now, we don't want to be silly about it, but we want to, be, we want to turn the other cheek. We want to represent Christ at all points. And so often it's how we handle ourselves in our, in our business teams. Oh, there's such a thing as being firm and not letting some devil-filled person do what he's not supposed to do. But, but on the other hand, there's a way even to, to win that man with strength, knowing how to let your light shine at that point. Well, you know, this is worth the whole sermon. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But it, if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now, let's close with this verse. We really need God's help here. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. When I came to Scott Depot, I gave up what I thought was life. Because, dear ones, my impression of West Virginia was not much better than my impression of the, of the darkest of Africa. I didn't know any better. And I never told anybody that. I'm telling you, but I'm a West Virginian now. I can talk this way, see. First time I ever used the word hillbilly in this pulpit was the last time. Boy, it was a freeze over this place. I just thought, you know, referred to ourselves as hillbillies. Well, not everybody feels that way. Mountaineers, I found, is a more respectable term. So I've never done it. I think they told me that the folks from Michigan call themselves 
hillbilly sometime. Brother, your pa- pastor told me that. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but in face, if he says it is, I guess it is. He said, no, hillbilly is a Michigan term. Mountaineer is a, is a West Virginian term. But you see, I didn't use that anymore because it was offensive. Some of you may remember the day I used it. That was all. Boy, I saw the looks on your faces, and you were kind to me, but I knew I'd gone up the wrong trail. Now, Kermit Hodge can call himself a hillbilly. He does. But I'm not to do that. Isn't this something? What I'm speaking about at this point, you have to be very careful. You have to be very careful with, well, in letting your light shine, be very careful in all manner of speech. I'll let that go to later. When I came to West Virginia, I didn't know what it was like. I didn't know the greatest people on the face of the earth were here. I didn't know these light, these hills were full of lights. I didn't know that I would find my life here. I simply came to lose it. I came out of seminary and, 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 and the offers that were made to me that were attractive, I simply turned them down because Jesus said Scott Depot, West Virginia. And I was pretty convinced that it was... Now, I had some romance in mind. I thought, well, 30 to 40 people up in, up in the top of the mountain where you have to build stilts under the houses to hold them on the mountains. And that's, that was my impression. Where the sun doesn't shine but an hour, only when it's straight up. <laughs> I had that impression. But I, and, and of course, there was a certain loss for me. When Barbara and I came to Charleston, you see, we love Charleston very much, but when we first came, we'd been used to the malls of Columbus and of Indianapolis. We couldn't find a covered mall around this place. And we thought we'd come to the backwoods. And, and, the, and the river was so dirty that she said, Oh, dear, she said. Jesus helped me to see more than that. I said, oh, Barbara. I said, I can't see anything but the people of God out here. It was so dirty. But see, she could see that. And, and she, when we, the first day we went to Charleston, she said, well, I'm not ever coming back. I said, I'm not coming back. Which I'll just stay home. Boy, did we go back. Because <laughs> see, up at the Eastland Mall or up at Indianapolis, is quite different. Now there's one being built. Up here, is it Ona or Barbara? Barbara, and one of those like we had 20 years ago, being built up here. But West Virginia hadn't developed that kind of concept in shopping. So all we could find was a group of stores in a row, a hex complex. And thank God for the hex complexes. They've been a great blessing to our society. It's been a part of our culture, and we've learned to appreciate that. Besides, how can you beat Diamond and Frankenburgers, and how can you beat uh, the Rose City Cafeteria or, or the Daniel Boone Coffee Shop? I mean, you know, these are great places. That There's a great tradition here. And suddenly we found the beauty and the picturesqueness of, of the old city of Charleston, and we don't want it to change. We're not that interested in the super block. Why? Because we found, we found the, the old school. We found the romance and the, uh, like Boom Tavern and Open Bria. We don't want that to be modern. We're happy with that, though there's some very modern things around here. But God wanted us to come and let our light shine. But in order to do it, we had to deny ourselves because we came out of something entirely different. We were coming to higher ground, the higher ground of God's will. We didn't see a sanctuary like this. When we came, there was a little red brick church by the side of the road. It was all by its lonely, out in the middle of a grass meadow, with a little parsonage over to the back of a parking lot that wasn't paved. And when I went through the whole complex, there was no room to put my books. And I, by that time, I had more books. There wasn't a room in the place. You remember the discussion that ensued? I went down to the little room downstairs and I said, well, this has got to be my study. It's the only place I got that I can build bookshelves. My wife said, oh, but this is the children's playroom. And we had to have prayer about what it should be. Couldn't come to an agreement because she needed a playroom and I needed to study. And we called Tom, Tom Harmon to pray with us and the witness was on study. So she gave up the playroom. 
Two years later, a church was built. I moved out and became a playroom. Isn't that wonderful how God settled that? You see, it was when we came, there was a denying of self because we we're accustomed to certain things. And we had to come to a place that we knew not. And immediately we fell in love with the people. Kermit and Thelma were the first that we had dinner with. And then we had dinner with Goldie and with the purse singers. And we found them to be a very precious people of a wonderful heritage. Of course, we were sort of on trial too. Were we going to love West Virginia? How was our light going to shine in this place that the gospel could get across? How were we going to respond, you see? All of this was involved in the outgrowth of our life. And look, this place, by God's grace, and you people are the wonder of the states. People come from, from the different states, the several states, just to come and, come and to worship at Scott Depot. People are moving in from different states to camp on this plate with us. It's such a wonderful place that God has given us. But it, it was this way before we ever got this beautiful building. The love of Jesus and His people and the shining of God because we had learned something about crucifixion. Denying ourselves. Said, except a corn of wheat fall unto the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it fall to the ground and die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And the problem that I've had all my ministry is with those who are trying to save their life. I've had a lot of people agree with what I've tried to say. Hey, isn't it wonderful to be a universal church of God preacher? I mean to love everybody. Well, who can argue that when you get right down to it? Who can argue with the scriptures as I've preached them? Who can argue with that? But brother, back of it all and underneath of it all, there is a call to death. And most of all, that call to death is symbolized by the pocketbook. And when I'd come up against the pocketbook issues, the curtains would drop in the eyes of the so-called saints. And I knew that the separation had started. When I got up against this, every time I was into it. When I asked that men leave all to follow God. When I asked that men put their pocketbook in Christ's hand and let Him do it. Because if a man makes a million dollars, the Holy Ghost most likely will require 800,000 of it in the kingdom of God. That's where the witness is. God gives us that money-making ability so to be used in the kingdom. When I come up against it, the lights would go down. Then they'd find a reason to reject me. You see, what happened? God helped me to shine the light of the gospel and it, sh- it shone in the darkness of men's hearts and they rejected it. Why? Money had them. Homes had them. Jobs had them. When all the while, if they'd given it up, let their life, we could have built this building a long time before we built it. It could be paid for now. We wouldn't owe a million dollars on it, which is the payback. If God had had his way, if Jesus had had his way, he's going to take care of it. He's going to provide. He's going to be with us all through the 80s and through the 90s if he tarries. But oh, how much better if men could have hurt him. How much better. But the lights are... And say, it's not just the wealthy when the curtain goes down. It's the man that makes 100, 200, and 300. Of course, when the when it goes up to a thousand a week or more, the, the carnality and the covetousness is hard to give it up. I've seen people that are able to tie ten dollar on a hundred, but brother, it was harder to tie thirty on the three hundred. And of course, it shows what's in our hearts. Oh, for oh, for the deliverance of Almighty God, so that money doesn't mean anything. Don't you know, dear ones, that all these love offerings and all that we've been able to give means that there's a, there's a day coming when God pulls open a wind of heaven and dumps it out on this place. That's His Word. There will not be room enough to refill it. I tell you, we've given and we've given and we've given and there's a law of return involved here. We don't do it for that. And if the rapture comes before, when I use that statement, all that might be offended with it, remember, rapture means caught up. I have a good time using it because it aggravates the carnal. Not, not the premillennial people. They don't aggravate them because they believe that we're going to be caught up. And, and, uh, and we know we're going to be caught up because they're going to be caught up with Christ. All Christians are supposed to believe that. That's what the term rapture. It means rapture. Even in the Church of God hymnal that we have here that the Holy Spirit wanted us to have in this place, there's a song that talks about my raptured spirit. 
One of these days your body will be raptured, not just your spirit. See, our spirit's caught up in the heavenlies to be with Christ Jesus. Oh, how wonderful it is. How great it is for us to lose all covetousness that this light may shine. But it takes a death. How wonderful it is to give up your children, to give up your very family. And I want to read in closing here how Pilgrim's Progress starts out. This will illustrate it real good. Boy, I've just got started. I'm about ready to preach now at the end of the day. You see, folks, you're looking at a man. Let me tell you something. I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I need a lot of help. But you're looking at a man by God's wonderful grace through Jesus our Lord who has no covetousness in his heart. Brother, money doesn't mean a thing to me, and it never has. Now, I came here at $110 a week, and it didn't mean anything to me as far as money goes. Cars didn't mean anything to me. Clothes didn't mean anything to me. Homes didn't mean anything to me. It still doesn't, and I don't want it to ever get a hold of me because that's an that's a awful thing to go through. To have it. See, I've been so disturbed, been so disturbed. I came from a congregation where... Uh, where there was men who owned as much as a quarter of a million in those days, 10, 12 years ago, dollars worth of land who could, and would gross more than 80000 a year in corn. And at the end of the year, they'd given a $500 to the Church of the Living God. Brother, it spelled yellow right down their back. It spelled hypocrite through and through. I couldn't stand it. That was my last giving report. I said, God forever deliver me from giving reports. So when I get up and declare the gospel, deliver me from it. That awful thing called covetousness. But oh God, give me the strength to face this thing head on. And he's to help me down through these 11 years. Brother, I'm telling you, you are a miserable soul if you have covetousness in your heart. If you love money, you're in a mess. Brother said, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's what the King James and the New American Bible, Standard Bible says, the love of money is the root, root of all sorts of evil. God doesn't want us to love it. He wants us to give it to the kingdom, put it at his disposal. Be good stewards, but put it at his disposal. Christian's on his way and says that um, he got started and the evangelist is talking to him. And Evangelist said to him, Then said Evangelist, If this be thy condition, he said he had a burden on his back, you remember? <laughs> and it was heavy. It was a burden of sin. And Evangelist said, If this be thy condition, why standest thou still? He answered, Because I know not whither to go. Then he gave him a parchment row, and there was written within, Flee from the wrath to come. The man therefore read it, and looking upon Evangelist very carefully said, Whether must I fly? Then said Evangelist, pointing with his finger over a very wide field, Do you see yonder wicked gate? The man said, No. Then said the other, Do you see yonder shining light? He said, I, I think I do. Then said Evangelist, Keep that light in your eye, and go directly thereto, so shalt thou see the gate at which when thou knockest, it shall be told thee what thou shalt do. So I saw in my dream that the man began to run. Isn't that good? The word is a lamp. The, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And evangelist points away from himself and uses the word of God to guide the burdened sinner. God's word is a light that shineth in a dark place. And if people will obediently follow the light God gives, he will lead them to salvation. So I saw in my dream that the man began to run. Now he had not run far from his own door. All right, here we are, folks. But his wife and children perceiving it. I've seen this happen over and over and over and over and over and over again in this church. His wife and children perceiving it begin to cry after him to return. But the man put his fingers in his ears. Bless God, that's my comment. And ran on crying. Life, life, eternal life. So he looked not behind, but fled towards the middle of the plain. Life, life, think of it, folks. 
His wife and His children are saying, Don't do it. Keep the, eye, keep the light in your eye. Give it up. Die. Go for God. And, he, and they say, Come back. Don't you do it. So He puts His fingers in His ears and He hollers, Life, life, eternal life. Brother, and He enters in through the wicked gate. He's on the, high, the king's highway headed for the celestial city. Well, there's a lot of things try to knock him off. You and I have discussed some of those things, including the ground of Doubting Castle, where giant despair lives. But oh, dear ones, what a man. Life, life, eternal life. He saw the light. He kept it in his eye. And by denying himself, by losing his life, he came unto life. He found it forever and ever. Life, life eternal life. Would to God that we could stick our spiritual fingers in our ears and, and block out the, the cry of family and friends because it's here's where we're in trouble. And we might say within our, within our own hearts, I am determined to serve God by God's grace and to go with God all the way. I am determined to let my light shine for Jesus. For ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the light of the world. Ye are the good seed of the kingdom of God. Ye are the sons of the kingdom. And the good seed are the children. The good seed are the sons. And God has called upon you to shine in this darkened world. Yes, even little you. In your own precious, unique, particular manner, you're not called to witness like I do. You're not called to demonstrate like I... No, it's not your calling, but you have your calling. And when you're faithful and you feel that, there's a beautiful light that enters any room that you come into. Folks will know that you love Jesus. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works. Don't have false humility. That's another aspect we don't have time to go into. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. If your manner's right, they'll glorify Him. But if you're not willing to die, the corn of wheat going into the ground, there'll be no fruitfulness, and besides, you'll get the credit. Any man that thinks himself something or takes God's glory unto himself will be dealt with in some way like Herod was dealt with, who spoke like a God but did not give the praise unto God, and worms came and devoured him. There's an awful end for a man who takes the glory of God. See, that was a talent he had, but God had given it to him, and he wouldn't give the praise and the glory to God. Life, life, eternal life, let your light so shine. Because men are looking for the light. There's a lot who would like to be pilgrims, but they've never had a helping hand. May God help us to help them. Let us stand for prayer. Jesus, thank you. Seal this to our heart. And in this closing song, may we stand in honest appreciation and uh, true examination of our souls, but keeping our eyes upon Thee, that we would not be discouraged, but that whether it be chastening or whether it be enlightenment or whatever it be, we may be determined to be like Jesus. Grant it that it may be so this coming week. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.